Happy Sock Appreciation Day, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Daryl Taylor, and I will be moderating a session talking about transitioning from military to civilian cyber. Um, <clears throat> in this session, we're going to be uh, giving some advice from experts who have been in the military for quite some time and have made success successful transitions into the cyber realm. And we will kick off with some introductions from our panel. Uh, I will start off. My name is Daryl Taylor. I've been in cybersecurity for 24 years. I started out as a uh, cyber person in, right after my military career. I was a pilot for eight years, started out in cyber at the Army Research Lab, and have worked my way up through the cyber ranks, formerly as Chief Information Security Officer at a uh, SOAR startup for seven years, and then that actually got sold. And so that was a very successful transition. And so I will hand it off to my esteemed panel. We will start off with Josh. Hi, Josh Goflin. I am one of the security directors with AT&T. Essentially my role is being a VCISO for our state and local government customer base. I was Air Force active duty for 20 years enlisted. Uh, rose up the ranks through the cybersecurity force that way. So I've been in the field for about 25 years doing all kinds of cool things, both uh, followers of the military, FedGov contracting, and now with AT&T. Awesome, we'll uh, move on to Carl. Hi, I'm Carl Natson. I'm the CISO for No Name Security. Well, we're an API security company. So I lead the uh, internal IT security risk programs. Um, previously, I had eight years enlisted Army, uh, active duty. Most of that time spent working uh, with NSA at various field sites for NSA over time. And now uh, I departed in 2005, so it's been now 18 years since uh, since my service uh, and worked in multiple corporate environments, uh, CISO responsibilities at a few different banks and financials uh, uh, before uh, landing at the role I have today. Awesome. Let's uh, jump over to Steve. Hey, good afternoon. Hey, Daryl. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. So Steve Anderson from uh, AWS, currently the principal for DOD cybersecurity. Uh, been here for about a year and a half. Uh, just retired from the Air Force in January 22 after almost 29 years. Uh, so like a lot of the esteemed panel members here, I started out enlisted uh, about six years, ground radio maintenance, so electronics technicians, if you will, for air traffic control systems. I uh, got a commission and then went mostly into combat communications, worked my through, way through base communications, a lot of deployed time as a lot of other panel members here and then uh, moved into cyberspace operations about 10, 12 years ago, uh, done some strategic planning at the joint staff and, and uh, service level. And then a uh, final job culminated as the 6A Cyber Wing Commander, one of the two Cyber Wings in the Air Force. So thanks again. Awesome. And then we'll <clears throat> finish up with Jess, last but not least. Hi, uh, thanks for having me here. Um, my name is Jess Bishop. I'm a SOC Analyst Level 2 at Ideal Integrations. It's a MSP. Um, I have done a lot of jobs. Uh, I was in the Army originally as military police and military police investigations. From there, I got out and I did have done everything from procurement to, you know, cooperative purchasing and uh, project management. And I've been in the cybersecurity industry about a year officially now, like employed oh, oh, just over a year. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So what you can see is a uh kind of an interesting mix here. We have three that transitioned as enlisted. We have two that transitioned as officers. Uh, we have two that didn't have any cyber experience uh, before they left. Uh, we have two that are in the that were in the Air Force that were cyber guys. And we have three that were in the Army. So a good mix of individuals for you to learn from during this session. And so what I want to do is start it off with a, a few questions and I will just throw these out to the floor. Um, how did you start off, <clears throat> or how did your military background prepare you for a role in cybersecurity? So I'll, I'll jump in, Daryl. So I think, um, you know, I think everybody's experience are different because if you throw out the word cybersecurity to, to a group of folks, you're gonna get probably as many people in the audience to give you different uh, perception of what that means, right? And so uh, some people think communications and IT is still cybersecurity. Uh, not necessarily the same. So I think background-wise, training, education, and operations are kind of the three things that I, I throw uh, my background into. And so um, from an education experience, communications and information systems degree kind of started me down that path. 
uh, education uh, training, moved into whether from enlisted or officer training, we go to basic schools as all of us did in some form or fashion. And I think really it moves into operations and then those opportunities. And so I didn't start out in combat communications, really I would call cybersecurity. But as I, I moved up in, in, in different opportunities and different jobs, got me exposed to cybersecurity, the Air Force certs, uh, the compliance, the incident response, those types of things. I started to get a little bit more niche, I would say, into cybersecurity roles and functions, which helped me evolve. So I think different backgrounds, different opportunities, I think those are what prepared me for the different roles and opportunities. That's just my perspective. Thanks. Yeah, and I think uh, so we heard from w one of the seasoned Air Force uh, team members. Let's uh, go with the Army team member. And uh, Jess, you're you're brand new. So I'd like to hear your perspective on how uh, that transition uh, went. Um, yeah, you know, being military police and military police investigations, I mean, it, it, it's security. It's still security. Um, and deal with a lot with security with that. And even just basic military learning. I mean, that, that all prepared all of us for security in some form or another. But for me, you know, it was that combination of that security background and then getting out and going through, especially things like procurement and uh, like RFPs, RFQs, that kind of response is you really get to see how the business all works together. And so combining that security knowledge with the business knowledge, it it helped a lot. Because one thing I see that's frustrating for, for a lot of newer people to the industry is they say, why can't we just block this? Why can't we just en enable this? Because that's the obvious thing, but then there's always a business reason to it. And I, so I believe it helps kind of ground you back and say like, okay, well, there's a reason for this, so. Cool. So with that, I hear a common theme of a little bit of adaptability, a little bit of persistence from a lot of uh, individuals that I know that come from the military. Uh, Josh, can you kind of talk to those two points and and help people understand how that helps you in your day to day job? Yeah, absolutely. You know, folks that are veterans are, you know, highly structured. They understand flexibility. They understand you know, hierarchical organizations. And that definitely ties back into going into cybersecurity because every day you walk into a cybersecurity job is a new adventure. You're not going to see the same thing you've seen yesterday. You're not going to see the same thing you've seen last week. It's going to be something new, exciting. There's going to be a new breach. There's going to be a new uh, alert that you have to figure out what it is, what you're doing. And having kind of that background as a military person, regardless of what you're uh, NEC, MOS, or AFSC was, gives you all the right skill sets to be able to sit in that environment, not only succeed, but really flourish. Okay. Carl, what's your perspective on that? Um, yeah, I, I would add to that the um, uh, the, the perspective of, of, of the mission, which is essentially for me as a, as a, as a SOC floor analyst in NSA back in the 90s, those missions you know, we were supporting Kosovo or um, Chechnya. Like there, those are areas that that were there's a there's a good guy and a bad guy. There's a red team and a blue team. Um, understanding the parts of the battlefield, understanding the mission, and then uh, I think I carry that a lot with me in in cybersecurity today. Even if it's a if it's a commercial context, um, that there are there are ethics and and societal things that 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 we as cybersecurity professionals have chosen a side. Uh, we were, we're on the side of protecting our citizens and our customers and their data. Um, and I think that's an important um, DNA thread. Uh, and, and most of that I think uh, came, uh, grew in me during my, during my time in service. Cool. So we're gonna transition on understanding and helping the audience to understand what the hardest part of the transition was for you. Uh, because I think a lot of people are very, timid, skeptical, whatever you want to call it, about making a move from this secure entity that they have out to this big, bad, unknown world. And so what I want to talk about now is, is how that transition worked for you guys. And I know everybody has a different story. Some people retired, some people didn't. And so <clears throat> understanding how that transition works for each type of person, I think will help the audience to better understand you know are they are they ready to do this or if they are not ready what do they need to do to prepare 
So uh, I'll start with Jess uh, as the newest uh, transitionee. Um, yeah, you know, I got out of the military in 2011. Um, it, for me, a lot of it was, was being humbled in a way. Um, in the military, you experience things that civilians can't relate to. And that's something that you had to really keep in mind. I mean, that challenge of, you know, knowing that other people have had experiences too in their own civilian lives that you don't understand. And so not kind of like holding the military above everybody else, um, if that if that makes sense. And I think that will for a lot of it, because you get out of the military and it's chaotic. You go out there, people don't know how to stand in lines. They don't know how to, you know, the simplest things. You're like, this is so easy, but not everybody was taught that way, you know, and that's okay. And so I think that was the biggest challenge is, is figuring out how to navigate how to act in the civilian world, if that makes sense. So, yeah. And that's okay. So. And Steve, given that you're you've come out from a high level and then now are a a leader in AWS, what does that what does that transition look like for you from that from your perspective? Um, so I, I think you know to Justice's point, there's less than one percent of folks who've ever served on active duty, right? So I think you there is a niche just people who serve. We ought to be thankful for the nation. So I think finding that right time to transition is a challenge, no matter what level you're at. Whether you come in and do your first tour, four years, commission service, five years, or go on to do do many, many more, I think find that right timing. Um, to your point of when to transition, I think we all have to remember, no matter what we achieved in whatever organization, but military, since that's what we're talking about, when you step into another organization that you haven't served for or 20, 20 some years, be humble, right? Uh, what got you there may not get you where you need to be. And, and oh, by the way, it may not even be what you want to strive to be. So I think figuring out what you want uh, as you transition and where you want to do it at, which hopefully we'll talk about a little bit later. But um, I think those are two key important things, because if, if you're not foundationally ready, no matter what organization you go into and whatever level you go into that organization, you may not be successful. They may not perceive you as successful. It may not be the opportunity that you're try trying to achieve. So I think every situation is going to be a little bit different. Uh, no matter what level we 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 come out of in the organization. So. Cool. So, uh, for um, for kind of a follow on, what do you wish? What the what do you wish the private sector would have done to ease your transition? Or is there anything the private sector could have done to ease your transition uh, into into that environment? Um, and if if they you know, a lot of times when we transition from military unit to military unit, there's this welcome, there's this, you know, new camaraderie. There are these things that are done to bring you into their fold. Uh, I find that the private sector doesn't do that as much, but if there was something that they could do, what would be those things? And if they don't do it, what are the things that you can do to try to uh, to help your transition in that way. And I'll start that off with Carl. Well, first thing, I, th I think that there are, there are inconsistencies in the way private sector organizations help and support transition, but it, it is incumbent on each, each transitioning service member to sort of start with a default position that it's my job to earn my way into this organization, earn the credibility, adapt myself. Um, but yes, there are things that private sector organizations absolutely can do. Um, and a, a couple of things that m were, are meaningful to me in, a, in the private sector, uh, what I'm, some, some of the things I miss about the military are, are some of the ceremony elements of like promotion ceremonies, changes of command, um, uh, you know, and, and leaving a unit and having a going away party kind of thing. And I think that's like a, in, a, in the private sector organizations that do those kinds of things and celebrate career moves and transitions. That's a really positive thing that uh, is not even specific to people in the military, but it really it, pr it, it promotes a really positive cultural experience. Like this is a good place to have a career and people are, are welcomed and they're appreciated. Right. And what are your thoughts on that, Josh? I was absolutely fortunate when I transitioned from leaving the service when I retired into the civilian sector. I moved into a company that had a very large veteran presence. So there was already those kind of connected bonds 
And even if you didn't serve in the same service or serve during the same era, there's still that kind of, you know, brother and sisterhood of we've all served. And organizations that have employee resource groups that, you know, support veterans definitely help build that community. And that community then helps each other transition in. Like, you know, I moved into an organization that was not hierarchical in any way, shape, or form. It was super nebulous with lots of dotted lines, uh, reporting structure, which is the antithesis of what the military is that you know exactly who your boss is and who the next five bosses up the line are. <laughs> and I moved into a job that I had six different bosses on six different projects, all who wanted a piece of my time. And having those veterans that were in that organization help guide me through that transition was absolutely key to my success. Awesome. So, so you had the TPS syndrome, TPS report syndrome, and that'll be for for everybody who's ever watched Office Space. That's 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 great. Hey, Daryl, um, before you go on, can I can I add one thing just because of something you said? Absolutely. So, as transitioning members, and I and I agree with you know Carl Carl's point on every organization and the culture, which I think is key at each of those organizations is different. But I will offer that for veterans. Um, there's, you know, we, education benefits, GI Bill, post 9-11, other things like that are there. But I think as a nation and as a commercial industry culture has sh taken a shift in the last, I'd say, 10 to 15 years. And what I mean by that is you look at programs like SkillBridge or Hiring Heroes and other opportunities to bridge uh, transitions from active duty service uh, into civilian organizations have grown from my experience. And so uh, I was able to take advantage of a SkillBridge program. I know it's at AWS and Amazon. They've got a lot of hiring hero programs, a lot of those, all the services. And so I think uh, for the community writ large, if you don't know about those, you should. And if you don't, please go see your commanders because they do. I, these, are, these are mandated programs from, uh, from from lawmakers, and they're available to every veteran uh, in, in every organization. So I would just offer that some food for thought there. But something you said just keyed in on that. I want to make sure we highlighted that. Yeah, absolutely. And so that was one of the – that's in the list of questions. So, so that's a great segue to that. And for those of us who didn't um, actually have a cyber background in the military, and I think the only one are me and Jess, um, what was the, what were the programs or what was the exposure that allowed you to get, to get there? And if it wasn't from the military, where did you pick it up? And I'll start that off with Jess. Um, for me, you know, I was not considering cybersecurity when I got out of the military. It was one of those, it had kind of been interested in it for a few years around 2014, because I went through identity theft and I just got so mad. I was like, there's gotta be a way to stop this, you know? And at the time I had looked at a program, but I didn't have the financial means at the time to pursue anything like that. Um, 2020 came along and I was tired of my job, tired of all this. And I'm like, I'd been interested in IT and cybersecurity for a while. I'm like, why am, why am I holding myself back from this? Let's just do this. And I realized I didn't know where to start. I had no idea. Um, so I was like, well, I guess school is a great place to start because in the military, you go to school, you learn how to do your job, you get out and do your job. Mm -hmm. And I thought that, hey, this was the magic, the magic potion, right? I still didn't even know where to start with that because there's so many different options. So I actually went on LinkedIn and I typed CISOs in my area. <laughs> and there was a, 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 she was a CISO at a company local. And I was like, well, she looks really nice. I'm going to just hit her up. So I just sent her a message like, hey, can I pick your brain about this? And she was nice to get with me. And we kind of talked about some cyber programs. Um, and so that's kind of how I, I got the ball rolling. But I, I soon realized that college was not going to prepare me for the actual job. As I started going through the school, I was like, uh, I don't think I'm going to get to where I need to be. So then I just started networking like mad on LinkedIn. I attended webinars. I attended, you know, different s classes being held. I learned about a lot of parts of the industry and then narrowing that down to what I actually wanted to do was another challenge. But that that's where I just, I just, you know, Went for it. <laughs> yeah. So Josh and Carl, you guys were both in the in the thick of things for quite a while while you were uh, on active duty. And so I'm curious, was it a 
was it a foregone conclusion for you guys that you were going into cyber or did you just decide, you know what, I'm just going to continue or did you have any other thoughts of doing something else as you transitioned? I, I personally left security for about four years um, when I, I took a role as a contractor and eventually decided that I wanted to move home, start a family, kind of live like a normal life, you know, for in the, in the commercial world. So I went and worked in IT and I worked in IT for about three and a half years and uh, went back to security because I just found it, I found it not particularly fulfilling. And so, um, so in my career arc, there's about a four year gap there where I was uh, just a technology architect of just no, no, no security bent at all. Uh, and I missed it. I missed having the, the sense of mission and I missed the, the um, parts of the, of the, my previous life. And so I dove back in head first after a few years away. Awesome. What about you, Josh? So my story is a little different because I was career military. I served 20 years, but I knew that there was going to be life after the military. So even though I knew I was going to stay and I was going to retire out at my, about my 10 year mark, I started doing active research. You know, what jobs do I want to do when I leave the service? And that kind of helped me focus what schools I was going to go to, what certifications I was going to get. And even to a degree, I was able to finesse getting the right assignments within the military structure that helped prepare me for the things I wanted to do when I left the service. So I literally final out of the base on July 3rd, it was off 4th of July, because that's what you do, you celebrate, and started work at my new job on the 5th of July as a civilian or a Fed contractor. But I took 10 years to prepare for that transition by making sure I was doing the right things, getting the right degrees, you know, getting the right experience to set me up for that. That's interesting, being able to prepare ahead of time. And so that leads me into a question about um, as you transition out, everybody has to go through the interview process. And in that interview process, you're going to be asked questions. You're going to your knowledge is going to be tested, except I hope your knowledge is tested uh, and things of that nature. As people who are likely in hiring manager positions, what things are you asking, like based on your former experience in the military, what things are you asking veterans that are coming out of the military to assess their capability to be able to do the job? And I'll start with Steve. Thanks. Um, so my transition was a, a little unique, right? Because I, when I came out of cyberspace, as I've already said, but I did a little bit like Carl. Uh, I went to the financial advisement. I thought that's what I want to do because I love finance. So I actually got certified as a financial advisor and did that for a couple of months before I came back into the cyberspace business. So I, I say that because as you asked the question about what does it take? One, uh, I had an inflection point around Thanksgiving and said, I love cybersecurity. Why am I getting out of it? Well, because I left San Antonio and moved back to Missouri. I didn't think middle of Missouri was a really cybersecurity hub because it's not the West Coast, the East Coast or down south and some of the military associations with 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 commercial industry who help cybersecurity. So knowing where I was ending up at and and what I want to do, that's the type of things that I'm interested in from somebody who's coming into a job, right? Are you comfortable with where you're at? Are you ready to work for an organization where you can kind of commit yourself, no matter if that means a little bit of travel? Those are kind of the baseline questions. And then I get into uh, in Amazon, we have these leadership principles, right? So in those, uh, always raising the bar with who we hire. So if, if you're interviewing somebody, how are they going to elevate the game of the organization as a whole? If it's a specific program, if it's coding, how are they going to raise that game? So you're always increasing uh, your talent pool, but at the same time, you want to make sure that they're uh, adept or can integrate into the culture that you have. So I asked scenarios, right? If you're coming to this organization, give me a scenario of, uh, of where you had to disagree and commit. Uh, so maybe you didn't get that guidance in the military that you wanted, but you still had to do it. Some of us call that shut up and color uh, in the commercial <laughs> industry. Uh, that may be not as effective because there's business profit and loss that go along with those decisions. And so uh, sometimes you got to tell leaders that's not the right way to do it. And here's how we should do it. And then you have to you know, kind of show how to do that. And I say that because uh, even though we had, you know, in, in one of my organizations, we had the largest software coders in the Air Force. Right. But I'll tell you, one of the most brilliant coders we ever had was in our medical community. And it took a little bit of time for that person to cross flow. So I'm more interested in willingness, aptitude, ability to learn. Show me how you've been successful in those challenging situations. Because if you're willing to do those things and you can show that in whatever environment background is, 
I think you'll be successful in these. And so I think those are the type of questions that I draw out. Uh, I would like to draw out the understanding of how they can commit uh, and then bring, you know, elevate the game and integrate into the culture. So. Awesome. How about you, Carl? Any any thoughts around around that? Oh, yeah. Uh, I think Steve's spot on um, uh, to, to to be an adaptive, continuous learner. Uh, as the interviewer, what I'm what I'm going to be asking is I'm going to ask for proof, which is basically like, give me an example of a time where you uh, um, self taught yourself a new skill because it was needed. Or um, tell me about a time where um, you had a, a problematic relationship with a boss at work or a coworker, and what did you do to work through it? And so, so yeah, so I'm looking for those data points of evidence that show that this is a person who's self-aware of where they are, and they can adapt and and move move themselves to a spot that's uh, to be more of an asset to their organization. All right. And how about you, Josh? So I kind of have two standard questions I ask, and they kind of fall in line with what Carl and Steve are doing. But the first one is, you know, tell me about a project that you worked on sometime in your career that you're really proud of, and just let them tell that story. You can tell a lot about how detailed they were in that project by how detailed that story is. You know, they're going to tell you all the nuts and bolts and all the pieces and parts, all their troubles and tribulations and why they're really proud of that. And that tells you a lot about what their capabilities are. On the other hand, I go, what's the time that you tried something and you completely failed? And how did you actually move forward from that? Because sometimes our best learning tool is failure. You know, you bump against the wall, you fall down, you stand up and go, okay, that wasn't the right track. Let me move over here. Um, and then being flexible is kind of the thing. Um, the first interview I did for my first job when I left the service, um, had to be a little bit humble. Um, the person who was my hiring manager used to be my troop. So I was his boss of the military and now I'm being hired by him and he's going to be two levels above me at work. So that definitely is a different kind of power shift when you look at that and be able to get out of that, you know, mentality of this is my rank and that equates to my level of responsibility can be really hard for veterans and those who successfully kind of decouple the idea of my rank and my identity are the ones that are truly the most successful. Yeah, I'm going to come to you in just a sec, Jess, because I want to get a perspective on uh, as an interviewee and a new person, what are you looking for? But I'm going to uh, tag on uh, Josh's comment. Uh, when I was coming out of the military off active duty, I had I was going to a unit, the National Capital Region Information Operations Center. They, they weren't a unit yet. They were actually a transportation unit that was going to become a cyber unit. How we were going to do that was still up in the air. But um, I had a CW4 that asked me one of the most important questions I had ever been asked in my career. He asked me, so if you come here and a private tells you that you need to do something this way, what is your response? And are you going to listen? And I had to, I, th I thought about it for a second and I thought about, you know, well, if a, if a colonel came down and told me that I had to fire my weapon this way, but he didn't know uh, how to fire it and I had to tell him how to do it, I would hope that he would listen to me. And so I was thinking, I thought to myself, you know, I can't be, I, I can't carry my rank when it's something that I don't have expertise in. And I have to defer to experts. And so I answered that question and he was like, yep, you're in. <laughs> it, was, it was it was pretty easy, uh, you know, thinking back, thinking back on it now, it was it was it was an interesting, uh, just an interesting thought experiment in transitioning from one to the other, because all of the reservists are not military every every day right and so they have certain expertise and they come with things that uh may exceed the the knowledge that you have and so getting back to it jess what is when you go and i'm sure you've sat on an interview with someone before that's coming in new because it's always good to get both a, a leader's perspective and a a a person that's in the mix their perspective on how somebody's going to operate what was your take or what is your take on what skills and what things uh, someone needs to come in? What do you evaluate 
when you're talking to them? Um, for me personally, in cybersecurity, I have not had that. I have I have not been able to be a part of that yet. And I have what, worked. What would you? Ask? What would you? Ask? What would you ask? Um, for one, I'd want to see, you know, how they, especially in a sock, how they might handle change of plans. You know, because sometimes people were late relieving you and you can't just leave it's like like a guard post you can't just say okay i'm done i mean you probably could but it wouldn't be a good plan for your career um you know so things like that and you, like you you were all talking about you know some showing that there is the willingness to learn and showing that there is the humbleness to say i don't know this but this is how i would find out um and I personally, just because it's me, I, I would probably look for a little creativity as well. Because yeah. uh, sometimes sometimes sock work requires a little creativity in, in solving the problems. <laughs> yeah. And I'll, I'll tell you, so when I built my last uh, sock at uh, Logic Hub, that's now a part of Devo. I mean, uh, the product's part of Devo, but the sock is, was bought by Binary Defense. Um, I asked, I, I gave my candidates a test. Um, and what the interesting part was, and I briefed all of the people who were interviewing and evaluating, was I didn't care if they got the right answer. What I cared about is how they arrived at the answer they got. And then the other piece was whether or not they could talk. Um, and the reason is, is because at midnight, you might be the first person to talk to somebody. And if you can't communicate, that is going to be a problem. Now, all, a lot of things can be trained, of course, but uh, having that a natural ability just to talk, just to not stumble over your words, uh, being able to be succinct in your communications, I think that's one of the traits that a lot of military people have that they overlook greatly. Um, and so having, you know, just just throwing out little tidbits, everybody said a lot of things about a lot of different aspects and skills, but making sure that you emphasize your ability to commu communicate and the job that you had to do to utilize that communication might put you in a, you know, immediately in a leadership position. You may not be able to be the best analyst, but if you can talk to a customer, be confident um, and be succinct and instill confidence in the customer that you know what you're talking about, uh, that that goes a long way. I can't tell you how many times I listen to people talk and they are, they don't exude confidence. And I think so many military people uh, just have that nailed. And that is a, that is one thing that you need to make sure as you go through the transition and interview process that you capitalize on that capability. I, that I agree with that. I mean, the first the first shift I ever ended up taking straight out of training was an overnight shift. And some of those I worked by myself. And, you know, customers don't like being woken up at three in the morning, especially by their sock. It's, it's an instant panic. So you're having to communicate through their through their through their fear. And you have to be able to sit back and say, okay, they're afraid. They're taking out some of their fear on me. You know, just, just, just like with police work. I mean, people are afraid when people get afraid, they can bit me. Um, and that's not a reflection on them as a person. It's just, they're scared. So yeah, that, that communication, you're right. It's spot on. Um, yeah. Cause if you can't do that, I mean, you're going to have some angry people. So, yeah. so what, what things, so now, uh, let's say now the the veteran is in the cyber community, in the civilian cyber community. What things do they need to consider before making a pivot within their civilian career? Like, for instance, I started out uh, at the Army Research Lab and they they call me the scan boy. You know, I was I was responsible, and that's the lowest <laughs> the lowest possible uh, job you can have is is scanning everything and trying to remediate everything. And I even recall <clears throat> uh, being in an elevator. We were behind a set of double locked doors, and I recall 
being in an elevator and somebody talking about me, not knowing that it was me because they didn't know uh, who was doing the scans and making them fix things and said, gosh, darn it, they're making me fix this, this, and this. And I got to shut my computer down. I can't stand these guys. And I'm standing right behind them going down to the lunch room. And so I knew I didn't want to be there forever. And so I had to make a, a, a transition out of that job. And so, um, and I did, but I'm curious about your guys' story and and what you started somewhere and you're somewhere, you may be somewhere different now. For those of you who have, can you comment on what the uh, turning points or the transitions were in your cyber, in your new civilian cyber career? Well, I can sh share for me, I, I left the service 18 years ago. Uh, and in those 18 years, I've lived in Morocco, Virginia, Maryland, Minnesota, Iowa, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and California. Um, so for me, uh, they, my willingness to be mobile and to go where a great job said yes to me um, was really important. And that sounds trivial, but like that's the... Um, uh, for me, uh, having been in a, a role for a few years and, and kind of poking my head around and seeing that the best opportunity is not where I live right now. It, I need to really think hard about, about making a move uh, you know, back to the East Coast uh, because it's a great role. And so I think that ability to, or that willingness to say yes to uh, actual physical relocation um, is the only secret weapon I have. And it really served me well to, be, to, to, to say yes to great opportunities, even though they weren't in my city. All right. How about you, Josh? So I'd like to kind of take, you know, Carl's say yes mantra and expand on it a little bit. Um, being willing to say yes for things that are outside your comfort zone. Um, I was running a cloud platform, cloud platform security team. I was building tools, leading a team. And I had an amazing offer with AT&T to come work in a SOC and help build their SOC from scratch for one of their clients. I had no experience working in a SOC. I was not an analyst. I was a tools guy. I was doing kind of all the things that you'd expect someone who's on the traditional engineering path. And they made me kind of an offer I couldn't refuse and went, sure, I'll go do that. And I found something I was truly passionate about because I was willing to say yes to a job that was kind of really outside what I was prepared to do. And I was able to kind of have that foresight because I reached out and had mentors, you know, folks who were more senior than me that had been through all the, the trials and tribulations who gave me just solid sound advice both from military perspective and then civilian side so having kind of that background allows you to make the best decision and being willing to say yes whether it's relocation or doing a job you, you you're not ready for you know gives you tons of opportunity what about you jess um, for me, I'm still pretty new in my career, but, you know, previously I found if I start getting kind of bored with what I'm currently doing, it means I'm not being challenged enough. And so you, I personally like take on different responsibilities. And if I reach a point where I'm like, okay, even taking on the additional responsibilities, I want to be exposed to new things. Um, so I'll look for those opportunities and just keep my ears open for, for the opportunities. And like others have said, working through kind of a fear, you know, because we all have that when you think about starting that new thing, it's like, can I do this? You know, so sometimes when people present you with an opportunity, you just have to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, let's give it a go. <laughs> you know. So. Right. And Steve, how do you how do you navigate uh, moving people around in? their cyber career as you as you see them start to develop? Yeah, so I think um, the foundations that all of us have in the military is somebody says, pick up and go. I think that's a little bit different in the commercial world, but really it's not, right? Because we all volunteer for free to serve the military. You all volunteer for free to serve the commercial entity. So like Carl and even Joshua alluded to a little bit is picking up and moving if you want to do that for me. I knew I wanted to be back in Missouri where family's at. And my youngest son, by the time he was seven, he'd lived in seven states. So Carl sounded like kind of what you were doing, even though in the commercial world, I knew we wanted to be settled back home on the farm by family, but still willing to travel and commute to support the job. So I think if you find folks who are willing to do that, uh, whether it's on active duty or in the commercial world, I think that's a starting point for the conversation, not the end point, uh, even though it might be a different location, because if they're not willing to do that, 
uh, and they end up moving to take a job that they thought they were interested in, it, it might not last very long. So I think you have to have a broader conversation on, yes, are you willing to move? Is this job interest to you? Is it going to keep you motivated? Is it going to grow you personally or professionally? Are you going to meet the objectives of the organization? And then what's your, those may be the one to three-year goals, but what's your three to five and even 10-year goals? And that's something that I have found in my short tenure uh, in the commercial industry, that those conversations don't necessarily exist very, very often. And so I find my military background helping with some of those conversations is not only myself look in the mirror, where do I want to be three, five, 10 years from now, but those that I get the opportunity to work with, whether it's in strategic engagement like I do or business development or sales, uh, any of those other other functions of, of an organization, be willing to step outside the comfort zone in, in your vertical, as we call them, right? You may be a software developer, but you may be talking to somebody else who wants to do sales. How do you help them build down those paths and those goals? Because that is something that I, I do find a little bit of an anomaly in these organizations because everybody's focused on the, the, the sales, uh, the aspects, the P&L, the profit loss, and making sure that they can meet those those time marks. But uh, being willing to have those conversations and show that you're just as vulnerable, and but, but willing to have those conversations and help people succeed, even if it's uh, not the same path that you want or the same path that you've taken or the same path that you think they should do. You can share your thoughts, but in the end, help those folks develop what they think is best for them and their families, if that makes right. sense. So one final question before we uh, close with uh, our closing thoughts on around this topic. Um, one of the things that I think military people don't realize is that the interview is a two-way process and it's not just somebody interviewing you, but it's also you interviewing someone else. And I think it took me a long, uh, even as an officer, even, you know, as a leader, even coming out of the military, it just took me a long time to actually understand that. And what I want to ask you guys is, you know, what kind of leader should the veteran be looking for as they go through the interview process to identify if and when they can be successful and if that person is going to not be the best candidate for them to be successful because it's their selection in their career as well. So I'd love to get your thoughts. Any Anyone can chime in, but I'd love to get your thoughts around that. Yeah, I'll kick off. Um, yeah. One of the things that's really yeah. great about the military is you're exposed to a lot of different bosses over a relatively short period of time that you don't really see in the civilian sector. You know, you get a new commander every two years, you get new lieutenants coming in, you have people, you know, your master sergeant pieces, PCS is out, you get a new one coming in. So you get this really broad exposure to a lot of different leadership styles. And you can kind of develop an idea of what works really well with you. So when you're doing this interview and you're interviewing with a company, look for those leaders that mimic the behavior of the folks that you've had really great success with because you've had the ability that you know somebody else who's 25 that's coming out of college doesn't have you have experience of having about 10 different bosses over the course of four years or you know 100 different bosses over the course of 20 years and you really kind of know what works well and that's the experience that you can't buy on the civilian side awesome Anybody else like to chime in on that? I think just don't be afraid to ask them. Let's presume everything, all the other interview pieces are done. Don't be, don't be afraid to ask that supervisors, how have you developed the others who've been hired under your leadership? And see if it aligns with where you want. See if it helps you understand, do you, are you a good fit for that culture? See if they're gonna help you achieve your goals because you're going in bringing your value, make sure that you're valued as you come in, so. Right. And with that, uh, we're gonna wrap up with any final thoughts. I'll go around the, <clears throat> The, the room and, and see if anyone wants to give any last little nuggets of advice for those veterans that are starting to make this transition and what things they should be thinking about. And I'll start with Josh. So there is a great kind of convergence between the veteran community and the cybersecurity community. Both are very, very willing to help folks who want to be in that community. And then you have that segment of people who are both. It's just exponentially out there that if you want to be in this community, go out, network with folks, meet folks and talk to them. They will absolutely help you get all the things you need and give you the right tools, the right success plans. All you have to do is put yourself out there and ask. 
Carl? Um, just that we're in a we're in a, a a period of time where working remote is pretty common in a lot of organizations, and I'd suggest uh, just for for people who are early in their career, um, taking a remote role um, has some downside. Um, it limits the things that you learn uh, as as growing up as a professional, and it and it limits your ability to demonstrate. Uh, your readiness for new roles in leadership. And so uh, the earlier I am in my career, I'd be advising myself uh, to focus on in-person companies, even though a remote job might be kind of cool and pays a lot. Um, I do think of that as potentially a liability in the long term for a, for a young career person. Steve? Yeah, I agree. COVID has changed the dynamics, but I think you're seeing organizations go back to the in-person just because of the lost arts that are there and the growth opportunities. Uh, but to your point, the question I think uh, Josh said it very well. Network, look us up on LinkedIn, reach out. Jess did the same thing. Uh, it, it, there's a valuable resource by networking, and I'd say use us all. There's a lot of opportunity. Thank you. Awesome. And Jess? Yeah, I mean, the networking thing, that, that's that been one of my favorites. But also, you know, to remember that the military is part of your past and part of you, but it is not your entire future, and you are not the military. And that you need to move past your past to be able to be successful. Awesome. Well, uh, that concludes our session. I hope that everyone um, really appreciated the insights and the knowledge that all of these pros have tried to drop on you guys. And if you, you know, again, you can see all of our names. I'm guessing everybody's on LinkedIn. Uh, I think everybody on the planet now is on LinkedIn. That's a professional anyway. And so reach out if you have questions, if you want to follow up and give us a, a shout so that we can try to help you to move to the, the next level. And with that, I would like to say thank you all for joining and we will talk to you on the next Analyst Appreciation Day. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.